um, and say which organisation. This or meeting is being recorded. Or, bus or business that you that you work for. Uh, when we get into the uh, Q and A, uh, if you just if you just uh, put your hand up if you've got any questions, I think that's the best way we're going to be doing it today. So just to give you a, a brief, a very brief background to Dumfries and Galloway Sustainable Food Group, and then Abby's going to come in as well on that and explain a little bit more about what the group is. But basically, it's a collaboration uh, of uh, various organisations, third sector, public sector, uh, and like our organisation myself, which is the biosphere, working together to look at uh, food policy, you know, within Dumfries and Galloway, and looking at how we can uh, get equal access to uh, to affordable food and just basically just I mean we have got an action plan but we are working uh, yeah, yeah creatively and joined up across the region which is brilliant to see so uh, so Abby do you want to come in and just give a little bit more about the DG Sustainable Food Partnership and the the chef sessions today and what and what we're what we're planning on on those that's okay Sure, thanks Marie. Um, I think you, you covered it quite quite well. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm Abby. I provide coordination for the Dumfries and Galloway Sustainable <coughs> Food Partnership. Um, so my role is really to sort of support the partnership to implement that action plan. Um, the action plan covers various different themes, um, including uh, farming and communities um, and uh, tackling food poverty and food inequalities. Um, and a thriving and sustainable food economy is, is one of those themes. Um, and uh, and hence the, um, the the sort of reason for the chef sessions. Uh, so last year we formed in, in June 2020 and had a whole load of Zoom meetings. Um, but last year managed to have four in real life events um, that were based uh, across the region. So we had one uh, just outside Dumfries, one in Thornhill, um, one in Gatehouse of Fleet, and uh, one in Stranraer. Um, each of those attracted about 25 people. Um, in real life, let's say, and uh, those folk came from across the food system. So there were uh, community workers and growers and producers and farmers and chefs and education workers and um, uh, health workers, all sorts of different people. Um, and one of the things that came out of that was uh, the need for more food education uh, and an informal way for education for chefs and restaurateurs uh, around things like and, and looking at issues like um, circular economy, around seasonality, around access to, to good foods and local foods uh, for um, for our food businesses. Uh, so hence the reason for those. Um, and we thought we'd, we'd kick that off in a sort of light touch kind of way uh, with these webinars, just for sharing and exchanging uh, knowledge uh, and good practice um, and see what's already happening across the region, try and sort of support the good stuff that's already going on but also look for where we can uh, where we can build on that and um and kind of make more good stuff happen so that's that's probably enough of a background i think let's yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you abby brilliant so i'll talk to obviously today's session is part of the, the chef sessions that, that abby mentioned and the today's focus is what we're calling what's on the plate so we're going to be looking uh at what we can offer, you know, if we can offer more locally sourced uh, produce uh, for, you know, in terms of uh, chefs and restaurants and how we can uh, make sure that meat and dairy comes from high welfare farming, but then also we've got to consider uh, biodiversity as well in terms of uh, growing their crops or, or, or for agriculture or, or for farming. And so today we're going to have uh, two presentations, very diff different presentations, actually. Uh, we've got Kirsty Maudsley from Lean Bean in Thornhill, quite a new business, very entrepreneurial, if I should say so, Kirsty, in terms of what you're doing in Thornhill, is really exciting. And we've got Emily as well uh, from uh, Compass Group, who uh, provide contract catering services uh, across the UK, uh, and they're making huge improvements around sustainable uh, and local sourcing, so that'll be quite an interesting. So two very different uh, presentations, uh, doing great things with uh, food and local food and sourcing. So shall we start off with Kirsty's presentation? So we're going to have two presentations. The presentations first, then we'll do the Q and A after, and then open it out into a, an open discussion. So are we are, are we ready, Kirsty, with your presentation? As ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. That's really nice. It's nice to know that you can't see that I'm a constant deer in the headlights and absolutely winging it most days. Um, so, no, that's really nice. I'll just share my screen with you all. Um, 
Wiese. Everybody see that presentation? Okay, yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, so my name's Kirsty Maudsley. I was brought, it up, brought up in Dumfries. Oh gosh, how do I stop this from... Ah! How do I stop it from moving? You got it on a timer. No idea, not really. <laughs> right, okay, I'll, I'll get used to using these arrow keys very well, hopefully doesn't keep hanging forward. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, my name's Kirsty. I was brought up in Dumfries. Um, I actually studied PE teaching at Edinburgh University. Um, I've taught at both Annan Academy and Sanford Academy in the region during my 10-year teaching career, um, which I finally retired from in November last year. Um, just the business demands a bit too much and it was just juggling too many, too many straws. Um, curse, curse. Oh, sorry, Maria, I think you're muted. Were you trying to say something, Marie? Sorry. Marie, you are muted. I don't know how, that, how that's happened. Oh, there you go. Right. Back now. Okay, this is Kirsty. You, your volume is quite low, so I don't really whether you can put your volume up on your laptop or. Um, I mean, it's the size it goes on the laptop. Okay. Um, maybe I can move it a little bit closer. Is that any better? Yeah, a little bit better. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll shout. I'm used to shouting. <laughs> <laughs> Your PC's rattled. <laughs> I know, exactly. I'm used to filling a hall. Um, okay, we'll try again. Um, yeah, so was a teacher um, for 10 years. Finally gave that up to focus on the cafe. Um, I met my New Zealand husband, Ross, while travelling in America about uh, 12 years ago now. And we are um, happily settled down in Thornhill with our 14-year-old Cocker Spaniel, Benji who also works in the cafe, is meant to be on customer service, but he sleeps most of the day, doesn't do a very good job at all, actually. Um, I've always been passionate about homegrown, home-cooked meals, and that's thanks to my upbringing from my mother and my grandparents. Um, and despite my love of travelling, I've always tried to live as sustainably as possible, um, and make a conscious effort to reduce my carbon footprint and support the natural world. It was actually on a trip to Bristol that I experienced my first refill store. And I was actually really saddened that there were such few opportunities for this style of shopping in Dumfries and Galloway. And in Scotland as a whole, really, there's a couple um, up in the central belt, but it is kind of limited um, to up that neck of the woods. Um, and seeing this gap in the market, I immediately set about planning my own business around my passions of wholesome food, great coffee and zero waste living. So what do we do at Lean Bean? Um, it's our aim to provide an environment where people feel encouraged and supported to change their lifestyle. And that's both in terms of eating more sustainable, unprocessed, seasonal local food, and in terms of reducing your carbon footprint and just generally living more sustainably. Um, through interactions with customers, both in-store and over our social media channels, um, we hope to provide simple swaps that are cost effective and suitable for time poor customers, which let's face it is nearly everybody in the modern world, um, and ultimately improve the health of them and our planet. Our refill shop allows customers to fill up their empty containers um, with everything. We've got flowers, nuts, seeds, herbs and spices, hair and body products, cleaning products. Um, we also stock a wide variety of environmentally friendly products and gifts like sanitary wear, dental care, skin care, and reusable food and drink containers. Our cafe serves hot and cold drinks as well as breakfast, lunches and snacks. Everything's made from scratch on the premises using unprocessed foods, no refined sugar, and it's made with local seasonal produce as much as possible. Um, we actively encourage customers to bring their own containers and cups by offering a discount and we've um, also started a cup deposit scheme um, in the last few weeks as well. In terms of seasonality, um, I'm a keen gardener. I'm not very good at it, um, but the success and the unsuccess has taught me so much about the seasonality of our food and given me a real 
admiration for people that do grow their own successfully um, and live that way entirely. I'd love to be completely self-sufficient in the garden, but everything I grow um, would feed maybe me for one meal, I think, at the moment. So I'm working on that. Um, we have three menu changes each year, mainly because, let's be honest, in Scotland, you don't get much of a summer season. It's very short-lived. So we do a kind of spring-summer menu, um, which um, focuses on lots of like your salad leaves, tomatoes, cucumbers, beans, rhubarb, everything's really fresh tasting with light dressings. Um, then in autumn, we go into our kind of root veg, parsnip, squash, carrots, um, and that's when we start offering hot lunches and filling rice bowls. And then in the winter, it's mostly potatoes, um, cauliflowers, onions, mushrooms, apples, and it's all about hearty home stews and curries, which I think at that time of year is what everybody is kind of craving anyway. Um, we liaise um, all the time with our fruit and vegetable supplier um, about where our produce is coming from, what's in season, um, and we do our best to buy Scottish and British in season as much as we can. Locally sourced produce, um, that's kind of our key aim. We try to support the local community and um, Scottish produce as much as we possibly can. So we get our fruit and vegetables from Patterson's, which is in Longtown. They deliver to us six times a week. Um, our honey comes from Nith Valley Bees down in Kirkton. Flour we get from a farm up in East Lothian called Mungo Swells. Um, our tea is from the Wee Tea Company in Fife. Our coffee is Coffee Lab in Glasgow and it's absolutely top notch, if I do say so myself. Um, our salt is from Blackthorn up in Ayr. Bread we get from a gentleman who makes it just down the street from the cafe, so it's probably the um, smallest carbon footprint or food miles that we've got. Um, meat comes from the butchery in Lockerbie, and the gentleman who works there actually lives in Penpunt, so he drives by our door every day and can drop it in on his way home from work. Uh, our milk we get from Rowan's in Dalbiti, and we get our oat milk from Bros, which is up in East Linton, and they actually deliver to Rowan's, who then deliver to us. So um, Rowan's is kind of the middleman for our Bros deliveries as well. Uh, our cheese and yogurt, we are now sourcing from Loch Arthur and Beeswing. Uh, eggs we get from Nith Valley Eggs just around the corner. And our rapeseed oil comes from Black and Gold um, up in East Lothian. We believe it's really important to source food from as locally as possible. It saves on fuel costs, it's fresher, and it obviously supports local businesses as well. And I like that we can showcase what diverse produce our region and our country has to offer. Um, where our suppliers like Patterson's Coffee Lab and the Wee Tea Company obviously can't produce their product in this country, we are confident that they are sourcing the produce, coffee and tea as sustainably and ethically as possible. And that way our money supports local suppliers and they then support communities around the world. Uh, we regularly get people asking for dairy-free milk in their drinks. Um, when we only offer oat milk, some ask why we don't offer coconut milk or soya milk products. Um, and it's always interesting having these conversations with customers as we tactfully put that we use local suppliers as much as we can and we're not very good at growing soya or coconuts in Scotland. Um, However, as we're good at growing oats, that's why we then use oat milk. And 99% of our customers are really pleased with that response. And many claim that they've actually never thought about it like that. And will try to use oat milk as their dairy-free alternative going forward. But a similar situation, people ask why we don't use oatly milk, as some claim it's tastier and cheaper. And again, we try to educate people that oatly is owned by the Chinese, oats are grown in Sweden, we use tetra packs instead of glass bottles, and their stakeholders contribute to the deforestation of the Amazon. Um, again, many people see that it's vegan on the packet and just automatically assume that it's going to be a greener choice. And um, so it's about educating people as to the reasons why we stock some things rather than others. Um, we only stock rapeseed oil in our refill shop and that's all we use in the cafe. Um, it can be used in much the same way as olive oil, um, but obviously we can uh, uh, produce an abundance of rapeseed oil in Scotland, um, whereas olives, not so much. Um, our customers are appreciative and understanding of our values and many now come to our shop for the sole reason of being able to buy local produce. I find when I go out to eat, I always ask where my food is being sourced from and I love when the waiters compassionately give you this information or even better if it's already on the menu as to where it's come from. Circular economy and reducing waste, I would say this is the biggest one for us. We have a really big push on this um, and we very much found that if you don't ask, you don't get. Uh, when we were searching for our refill supplier for our personal care and cleaning products in the refill store, we came across Minimal. And they're a company in Yorkshire, and they seem to be the only ones offering a fully circular system. 
Um, this means that when we buy a five litre or 20 litre container from them, and once we've got 24 empty containers, they get sent back to the company where they're refilled and reused over and over again. And to date, we've actually saved nearly 2,500 mil plastic bottles going to landfill. Um, and this got me thinking about what else I could request no waste with. So by simply asking the question of my suppliers, I now return all containers and have a circular system with Patterson's for our fruit and veg, Coffee Lab for our coffee beans, the Butchery for our meat, Hamam's for our bread, Nith Valley Bees for our honey, Rowan's milk, Nith Valley eggs, and black and gold oil. And this has obviously saved hundreds of boxes, bags, drums, containers, jars, and cartons going to landfill. For anything that isn't circular, there are several local businesses in Thornhill that offer delivery. So we now donate any boxes or packaging that we can't return to our suppliers for them to be used instead, again reducing the amount going in the recycling bin. Um, we recently began piloting a scheme called Yo-Yo Cups in the cafe. Um, and if customers don't have a reusable cup, we now offer them the opportunity to use a yo-yo cup, which is a double-walled stainless steel cup with a silicon lid. Um, and customers can buy one for £3, and when they return it, they get their money back. So far, it's been extremely popular with our customers, and we've saved hundreds of single-use paper cups in just the two weeks we've been running it. They were actually designed by a lady in Moffat, um, and they're based on a similar system which runs in Australasia, which Ross, my husband, um, it obviously used quite widely when he was home. Um, and the again again cups can be bought or returned at millions of cafes across Australia and New Zealand. Um, it's our hope that if the pilot continues to go really well at Lean Bean, then maybe yo-yo cups will be taken up by cafes in Dunkirk and Galloway and then across Scotland. So if people are visiting our cafe for the day, they can buy a cup and then they can return it at a cafe closer to their um, home or somewhere else on their travels. Um, we always ask customers if they wish their drink or lunch in a reusable container first before offering a single use paper one. Uh, I think our regulars got so used to me asking them that nearly all of them now bring their own. Um, and I think by always asking for a reusable makes customers more aware of how often they're answering yes or no to that question. And at some point it does stick. We don't offer napkins or bags or cup carriers and instead we wait for customers to re request one because Nine times out of ten, they don't actually need one or don't think about it. It's only when you actually get it handed to you, you just naturally take it. Uh, our cutlery is from Vegware um, and made from plants that will eventually decompose after a long, long time. Um, however, we always make a point of saying to customers that it can be washed and kept and um, kept in the car and reused at other opportunities. So try not to just throw it away after one use. We don't offer anything in plastic in the cafe or in the retail shop. This includes drinks, condiments and straws. But we do offer plastic free alternatives for these items so that we can make people more aware that there are other options available. Most people who use our retail shop do bring their own containers, but quite often you see something you maybe hadn't planned on buying or it's been a prompt impromptu visit that you might not have a bag or container with you. In that case, we've got a range of jars, we call them pre-loved jars, that people have brought in and they've been washed and people can use them to fill up um, their own. Or as a last result, we offer a paper bag as a kind of last option. And it's amazing what containers people find to be used when they bring into the refill. Um, we've had bread bags, blueberry tubs, um, canvas bags, we've even had crisp packets. Um, and it's just really lovely to see all these things being reused rather than just tossed in the bin. Uh, we're currently working on a pilot scheme with South of Scotland Enterprise to track our carbon footprint from supplier to consumer in both our cafe and in our refill shop. And with a benchmark, we feel it can only allow us to improve and for other businesses and companies to make changes too. Opportunities. We've genuinely thoroughly enjoyed our first year of business. We've enjoyed having the opportunity to meet so many local producers and businesses and work with them, allowing us both to benefit from the support network. We've met so many wonderful people, our customers, um, who are valuing the impact we're making and what we're trying to do. Constantly researching and striving to know more about how we can better protect our bodies and our world and then educating others is a really, is a really pleasant experience. We've had opportunities to spread the word about our little business through interviews um, with South of Scotland Enterprise and also being a finalist in the Dunkleese and Galloway Life Awards. We'd love for the majority of people to Thornhill to come to us for their staples rather than going to get them from the big supermarket. I know my friends and family still go down to Tesco and buy their oats, their pastas, their herbs and spices there. Um, but we do understand that everyone is time poor and there, there is that misconception that a refill shop is going to be more expensive. 
and we do hope that over time we can remove these barriers for people. Owning a business and particularly one where you're striving to be as sustainable um, and environmentally friendly as possible does not come without its challenges though. Our biggest challenge is obviously trying to be as zero waste as possible, but when you're so reliant on other companies doing the same, that can be really tricky. It takes so much time calling suppliers, asking them about their packaging methods, and many of them simply don't know whether the pasta comes in paper sacks or plastic bags. Many tell you they'll look into ways to reduce their packaging and you don't hear back from them, and some of them just send you everything wrapped in bubble wrap anyway. We find that the larger the company, the less environmentally friendly and accommodating they are. And although many of the suppliers have supported our aims, there's still a long way to go. We're constantly challenged by greenwashing on social media. People see a buzzword and they immediately believe that they're supporting a greener way of living, when in fact, many are not always seen. It's time consuming, constantly trying to keep up with all the new eco-friendly brands and sift through all the jargon. As with a takeaway, obviously a huge challenge for us is reducing our single use. Despite our discount scheme, cup deposit scheme and our encouragement, many of our customers still come in each day and take a paper cup. We really try hard to push reducing and reusing and see recycling as a last resort, but we're aware that we are still sending far too many single use items to recycling or to landfill each day. On the other hand, some people can expect perfection. They can expect you to be totally nailing the zero waste path and have the greenest stockheads and be all knowledgeable, but in truth, I'm learning to very much on the hoof and I'm honest with my customers about that if I don't know something or I haven't heard of something. It's a learning curve for us as much as it is for our customers and they appreciate knowing that we are learning with them. And finally, a big challenge is cost. It still costs so much more for us to buy products from small businesses with high ethical and sustainable practices than it does to buy from big companies. This makes our costs much higher, and because we're always striving to make our products affordable, which would greatly reduce then your profit margin. Uh, I feel people need to stop asking why things are so expensive and instead ask why things might be so cheap. And finally, thank you so much for listening to me this morning. Um, as I said, I do feel grossly underqualified to be doing this today. I'm the first year of business in, but um, I, um, I have completely, I've really enjoyed um, sharing my ideas with you and my experiences and I look forward to hearing some of your ideas as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty. That was absolutely inspirational. What a fantastic business. Thank you. I can't wait for the questions afterwards, but that was absolutely Amazing. I think I mean I've met you before, Kirsty, but I've never heard a lot about it. But I think that was absolutely fantastic. Thank fantastic. you, Lee, that's really kind. So, should we, should, I know but I'm sure people have got lots of questions right now, Kirsty, but we're going to have to just pull back on the questions until we've got the next presentation. So, I just want to introduce you now to Emily Rob Robertson, who's from uh, the Compass Group, who I mentioned earlier, who are a catering service who cater across the UK. Uh, and have made improvements in the sustainable ability and local sourcing. So over to you, Emily. Robinson, sorry, I said Robertson, sorry, apologies. <laughs> That's all right. People interchange that all the time, I don't mind. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Okay, amazing. I will uh, share my slides and hope to not have any tech issues. Bear with me. I have to remember what I was told to do this time. Does that look okay? I can't now see anyone. So. Can't see anything yet, actually. Oh, really? Uh huh. <laughs> just needs a minute. Did work in the tech check eventually, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me. I will try one more time. Hang on. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Okay, hopefully you can see a full screen now. That's great, Emily, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, sadly, I was supposed to be joined by our um, culinary director um, for Compass Scotland, um, Graham Singer, um, who was going to be able to bring what I'm talking about to life a little bit more um, 
for the audience of, of this webinar um, but sadly he's had to drop out due to some personal reasons so um, I'm going to try and uh, hold the fort myself um, I'll try and answer as many uh, questions as I can but I can absolutely bring some questions back to Graham if it's specifics to kind of food and 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 the things that he he does but um, I will I will do my best to hopefully give a, a good presentation on his behalf um, just a bit of a background um, and an introduction to my role. Um, I am a nutritionist. Um, I have worked for Compass for three and a half years um, in London for the past uh, three years. And in October last year, um, I moved up to Scotland where um, I was fortunate enough to get a new role as the um, senior nutritionist and sustainability lead for um, Compass across Scotland. Um, brand new role and um, we've not had a nutritionist in the Scottish business before um, and it's absolutely key because we have a completely different government up here and um, we like to do things differently to England so um, it, it's a great new role and I work closely with Graham um, who as I said is the culinary director um, for Compass Scotland. Um, so for people who don't know, Compass are often kind of known as the silent caterer. Uh, you don't see the name Compass Group plastered over everything, but we cater um, a lot of places across the UK. Um, Compass Scotland is part of Compass Group, um, PLC. Um, we're the world leading food um, and support service provider, so contract catering. Um, and we operate across a large range of sectors so um, including things like business and industry so that's like office catering um, healthcare, education defense offshore um, remote and then sport leisure and hospitality and then in Scotland we operate um, in over 350 sites so you can see some of them on the screen that I've tried to pull out some of the key ones that hopefully some people will recognize places like the SEC and the Hydro, Edinburgh Zoo, Scottish Power, the Edinburgh Conference Centre um, and Compass Scotland was launched in January 2021 um, we've always had business in Scotland but we've never had an identity for Compass Scotland and the reason for this was to give a new identity um, for Compass in Scotland, reflecting essentially our commitment to, to Scotland and the country, allow the leadership team to be present in Scotland um, and allowing us to really focus on what we can do specifically in Scotland. So um, a lot of what we've talked about today is about the local supply chain. And we know that we're very fortunate in Scotland to have a great uh, local larder um, that's completely different to England. So um, the reason for Compass Scotland existing is so we can put really real focus on what we can do specifically in, the, in this country. Um, and then just some large events that we've catered for that I will um, talk about briefly, but um, the obvious one of COP26, we were very fortunate enough to be the, the caterer for that event um, and things like the Fringe, which I know um, obviously happens every year and we're, we're very close partner to that. So that's just a bit of an overview of Compass Scotland. Um, before I just go into um, some detail, I just want to show you this video, which is um, from our uh, Net Zero director, Caroline Ball. Um, in May 2021, Compass UK and Ireland made an ambitious commitment to reach net zero by 2030. Um, so this is just a short video um, explaining the start of this journey. I hope the sound will work when I play this. Compass Group UK and Ireland is the UK and Ireland's largest food services company and we have a leading role to play in protecting our amazing planet. In May 2021, we made the necessarily ambitious commitment to reach climate net zero by 2030. We have a roadmap, we have targets validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative and we have a super talented team determined to make it happen. Our climate promise isn't blinkered by carbon impacts alone but resolutely focused on how we can work better together in every sense. Supported by leading climate consultant South Pole, we have measured our carbon footprints at 1.2 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent and identified the emissions for each of our sectors. We've created low carbon menus by increasing local, seasonal and plant-based ingredients, as well as reducing food waste. We've launched a milk pilot to support our engagement with over 500 farmers with dairy representing 10% of our emissions. We're on track to switch to 100% renewable electricity within our managed sites and launched our car policy 
to reach 100% electric fleets. We banned air freight for all through the edge across our business and partnered with Oxford University's LEAP program to introduce eco labeling in more than 300 sites. We've commissioned the build of a carbon footprinting tool to measure the emissions attributable to our catering operation beyond just the food and drink. And we've welcomed applications for our one million pound seed fund to accelerate R&D. We've eliminated around 142 million items of single use plastics and partnered Incredible Edible to support its extraordinary work with communities. We've launched an apprenticeship programme with Marcus Waring with a dedicated sustainability module. And we've catered and cleaned for COP26 with a clear food strategy, footprinted menus and a commitment to using our learnings as a legacy for positive change. We have supported hundreds of clients in their net zero journey. This is without question the most important work of our lifetime. And we'd really like to thank everyone for supporting us and joining us in the journey so far. All our colleagues, suppliers, consultants, clients, academics and partners. Together we will and we must continue to be a catalyst for transformative change. Don't want to watch that again. Can you still hear me now after that video? Yeah, okay, grand. Um, so that's just a bit of an overview of um, the start of this journey. Um, this roadmap is it's um, online. You can find it if you want to look at it in a little bit more detail. Um, but this is our roadmap to climate net zero across our, our UK and Ireland business. Um, and some of the key food commitments on there that I just wanted to pull out um, is that we, we want to work towards a 25% switch from animal proteins by 2025 and 40% switch by 2030. Um, we're working towards a 50% reduction in food waste by 2030. And we're also working towards 70% of the top five food categories in our business, which are dairy and cheese, fruit and vegetables, pork, beef and chicken, um, to be sourced from regenerative agriculture by 2030. Um, there's lots of other commitments in there that you can see, but that's just to focus on some of the food ones that um, Graham was going to pull out. Um, so just a bit of a deep dive into what we're working on, um, and these are the sort of things that I work a little bit closer on as um, a nutritionist with our chefs and our business. Um, plant forward menus, this is a huge one for us, obviously you see from the previous um, commitment that we have quite a um, journey to go on to reduce, re reduce it by 40%. Um, but we're working on our menus being a lot more plant forward. Um, and obviously there's a, a bit of confusion that um, a lot of people find between the terminology of plant-based and plant-forward, vegan, vegetarian, there's all sorts of different terminology. And I think it's quite important that we find to make sure that we define it properly to our customers and actually to our chefs and everyone internally as well. Obviously, I'm probably, I'm telling people um, who already know the answer to this, um, but obviously plant-based is solely based on things being made from plants um, and dishes. If it's plant forward, it doesn't need to be completely free of meat um, or animal products, but it is skewed more towards um, a plant whole uh, meal. Um, so plant forward is really what we're going for. We don't want to create a huge transition instantly and remove all meat and animal products straight away from our menu because that's not something that customers will um, cope well with but it's a gradual transition um, and for menus to be a lot more plant forward um, without kind of screaming it in people's faces it's just the the natural way that our menus are going to go um, so for example some of the things we've worked on um, and I will explain about COP26 on the next slide but one of the things that the chefs and actually Graham uh, created was um, a 50-50 burger it's simple it's a huge seller in our business as a simple burger but we thought how how can we um, try and make that more plant forward without creating just a sole vegan burger um, so it's the simplicity of it being 50% um, locally sourced meat from Scotland um, and 50% uh, root vegetables and spelt um, and I, I I was very surprised when I first tried it because it tastes exactly like um, a normal burger so that's just an example of trying to skew that balance a little bit 
Um, another thing that some of our chefs in our um, Levy business are, have been working on a lot is making the meat as the garnish. So we're used to ordering food and having veg as a, a side dish or a garnish, um, but they've tried to do that swap where the main focus of the dish is all about the vegetables. That's the center of attention, the plant foods. And actually there's option of ordering a very small portion of meat or an animal product as a side. Um, so just trying to um, be a little bit innovative in that sort of uh, skew. Local suppliers is another huge one um, that we've heard a lot on the webinar today, but um, this will be absolutely key with our ingredients. And as I said, we're particularly lucky in Scotland to have so many incredible local suppliers with real sustainable focuses um, on our doorstep. Um, this is where Graham would have been able to bring it to life for you, sadly, but he has absolutely championed this transition in Scotland. Um, he seems to know every every single local sustainable supplier in Scotland. Um, so he's done an incredible job um, with that in the lead up to COP26 and before that. Um, but it's about knowing where our emissions come from. So you, you could get beef from around the corner in Scotland, as we know, um, which would obviously mean less, less miles, but they might not be following the right sustainable practices and farming practices, meaning the emissions might then be higher from that. And if you then compare it to maybe a farmer in Cornwall, where obviously that is coming from further, but they might have very strong regenerative agriculture processes that they, they farm with, and therefore actually the emissions are lower. So sometimes it's not just about thinking, okay, actually it's just from around the corner, that obviously means it's much better for the planet. Um, you need to look at the whole picture, and that's a lot of what we've been trying to do is um, look at um, all of the different strains of, of the local supply chain um, and knowing that local is normally better, but um, you need to, you kind of need to look at the whole picture. Um, seasonal menus and recipes, this will also be absolutely key with all of our ingredients um, and only using ingredients from the correct time of the year. Um, we've used a lot of rhubarb recently across the business as it's obviously um, just in season, just coming out of season in, in the UK and Scotland, um, but not necessarily just always focusing on seasonal fruit and veg, but also thinking about that with um, fish as well and species of fish. Responsible sourcing is another thing that we're focusing on. So there's lots of things we've done in our business and that we're working towards. Um, for example, we're now um, officially 100% cage-free eggs across the business. We're working towards um, sourcing 100% sustainable uh, certified palm oil or not using it at all, which is a journey that we're, we're nearly complete on. Um, all milk from British Tractor Assured Farms um, and another one, a big one for us, is only sourcing um, MS, MCS 1 to 3 rated fish um, from the Good Fish Guide. I'm not sure if um, many people have heard of it, probably with the audience that's on here, but um, it helps everyone from chefs to consumers to make responsible uh, choices when buying fish and seafood. Um, and this Good Fish Guide um, rate species from one to five with one being the best choice and five being fish to avoid um, and we've already removed five um, and I believe four rated fish from our uh, seafood from our menus um, and we're now looking at um, hopefully just only serving one to three and um, so that's a big focus for us on uh, sourcing food waste huge one obviously we know that a third of all food in um, the UK is uh, uh, sorry, globally is wasted and 60% um, of this could have been eaten if we'd planned better, stored it better, managed it better. Um, and we know that when food is wasted, so is the energy that went into growing it, the harvesting, the transporting, the processing, the preparing it. So it's just a no brainer that this is such a huge, huge thing and a focus for the food industry and that we need to get it right. Um, the three stages that we focus on in our business is um, <coughs> prevention. Um, so looking at really training our chefs on how to prepare and chop food, um, development of food waste recipes, menu planning across different restaurants using the same food. Again, this is something that Graham is so imaginative in. Some of the recipes that he's pulled up are incredible. Um, so I can absolutely try and get some examples if anyone wants to see that from him. Um, second one is recovery. So obviously looking at surplus food donation, we work with partners like Fairshare, Too Good To Go, Olio, um, depending on whatever the circumstances are. 
and then the third part of that is recycling so recycling food waste properly um, with correct partners to ensure that it goes to um, anaerobic digestion for example and not landfill um, some examples just to bring it to life a little bit um, we've um, in Scotland actually I think it might be in the hydro um, in the SCC um, is working with a, a company where they collect the coffee grounds and they recycle it into environmentally friendly alternatives to existing products so um, for example using the oil from the coffee um, for soaps um, obviously in a venue like the SEC and the hydro we generate a lot of coffee uh, grounds so it's just um, being clever about what we do with them so it might be as I say working with a partner like that but a lot of our chefs have been doing development with using coffee grounds in recipes um, they're doing a lot of recipe development right now um, they call it from root to tip or from nose to tail uh, so making sure that everything is used um, so as I said coffee grounds they're using it in things like um, muffins or granola, um, broccoli stem pesto, um, using the entire cauliflower, including the leaves um, in salads or um, stir fries, things like that. Um, aquafaba mayo, so the, the uh, liquid from chickpeas. Um, so they're doing a lot with recipe development at the moment. Um, and then we're also working with Zero Waste Scotland um, on a large food waste reduction project across the SEC and the hydro venues. Um, to kind of weigh the food waste, get a baseline and do an intervention on trying to reduce that massively across our venues. Working with farmers closely, so I've kind of touched on this a bit with our local suppliers, but it's important for us to ensure that the farmers we're working with um, or that we're using are working towards farm processes that, that support net zero um, and that they understand where their net zero emissions, emissions are coming from. Um, and working in partnership if they need support on this as well. Um, it's, it's not just our journey, it's everyone's journey. We want to all get to the same place when it comes to the environment. So it's really important that we work in partnership with our suppliers. Um, in Compass Scotland, we're at the start of a journey of working with a very knowledgeable farmer in Scotland, um, where we've got kind of three key focuses of um, regenerative agriculture, so building the soil structure, improving the ecosystems on, on a specific point of his farm, hyper-localisation, hyper um, so having a farm near our supply chain, um, having local produce, being able to reduce the packaging of that, um, and then circular infrastructure, so I guess a waste stream innovation, like looking at how we can put back into the farm, um, so early stages, but that's um, kind of an example of working closely with our farmers uh, locally. And then the last one is education, which um, to me is absolutely key um, of our customers to understand why they need to be or should be making certain choices um, or why they need to be uh, reducing their food waste, um, training our teams internally, training our chefs, training our operators, but also children as well. I work uh, across our schools in Scotland as well, and we do a lot of educational workshops. Um, it, it's crazy to know how much the kids actually know nowadays and how interested they are in the planet, but it's a, hu it's a huge thing that we need to make sure we're teaching the kind of next generation um, about their food and where it comes from and what we need to do because it's, um, it's, in, it's in their hands as, as much as it is ours. And then just to touch quickly on COP26, because I know Abby had mentioned this, <laughs> and this is would have been one thing that Graham covered, but we were the official caterer at COP26 um, in November last year at the SEC in the Hydro. Um, there was 40,000 experts, politicians, high-level officials, um, 300 heads of state, uh, 15,000 delegates every single day that we had to feed, um, including... Barack Obama, who strangely requested um, s salted peanuts <laughs> as a snack, which was a new one for us. Um, but this, this event was a prime example of needing um, to implement sustainable catering from all angles. So just some key uh, stats to pull out for you guys. 60% uh, plant-based and vegetarian menu mix we had, um, including things like plant-based soups and pastries. 50-50 um, products with reduced meat content. So like I mentioned before, our burger and our sausages. 95% um, of the food for the, for the event was sourced from the UK with at least 80% coming from Scotland. Um, and most of our suppliers were based within a 100 mile radius of Glasgow. Um, 
focus on food waste, for example, ingredient replication across our menus to make the most of all the ingredients, reusable hot drink cups and refillable water bottles and water coolers. So uh, 100,000 single use hot drink cups were saved and no single use plastic bottles were used. Um, and then we had carbon labeling on all of our menus. Um, the meal footprint was um, one kilogram of carbon emissions versus 1.7 kilogram, which is the UK average, um, which was a good, um, uh, a good measurement. Um, and then one product that we did use, and we're still working with a team at, at Mara Seaweed, but um, I don't know if anyone's ever come across Mara Seaweed or using seaweed in uh, their food, but Mara are a, a, a company that use fresh seaweed and turn it into flakes and powder. Um, I've learned a lot about seaweed in the past couple of months, but seaweed takes carbon out of the atmosphere and releases oxygen. Um, it's incredibly fast growing. It doesn't need any intervention and no soil, no fertilizer, no fresh water. Um, and it, it, from a nutritional perspective, it's a great salt replacer. Um, so it's a really great product that we're starting to look at in our, in our supply chain. Um, just a couple of photos from COP, the incredible team up the top left, and you can see um, the kind of carbon labeling on some of them next to the dishes um, where it shows the customer um, and with a QR code of where they can look a lot more in depth about what we were um, telling them about. Um, and then just a bit of a uh, plug here, or not a plug because we want everyone to get involved, but Compass Group um, started Stop Food Waste Day um, in 2018, a national uh, or global campaign actually, um, as a, a day to try and really focus on reducing food waste. Um, and so um, definitely keep an eye out for this on social media on the 27th of April. Please do get involved and share with the hashtag um, because we want to put a real focus on this for a day, um, but uh, not just a day beyond that as well. But it's a good, a good opportunity to share best practice across the food industry. Um, that is it for me. Sorry, I probably rambled on. I can't see anyone, so I don't know how long <laughs> I've been speaking for. Um, apologies if it's too long, um, but I hope that was okay. And as I said, any questions that are more Graham or chef related, um, I will absolutely pass them on. I can get answers from him. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. It's quite interesting, two very extreme examples from, you know, <laughs> from a sort of, sort of a Somebody fulfilling the vision, you know, like Kirsty, what you were doing at Thornhill, to something like the Compass Group, which obviously is huge, uh, but then still got the sort of same values around looking at the bigger picture, you know. So I, I quite like the fact you said it's it's locals, not always better. And what you said, Emily, it's about the bigger picture and actually uh, how how you know food and supply chains look at sustainability in its broadest sense. So, but yeah, thank you, Emily. That was really really interesting. So I think now we're going to go to uh, question and answers. I think that's what we're going to do, aren't we, Abby? Is that the plan now? Yeah. So uh, I think we have. I think we might have a couple of questions in the chat. I think. I think, I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, there was a question. I think Simon put something up part way through. Do you want to read it out, Simon? You can just jump in and if anyone yeah. else has got anything else, just stick it in the chat or put your hands up. Uh, yeah, cheers. Thanks. Really, really interesting. Both of those presentations. Really good. I just wanted to add a question to, for Emily, just around the food waste and whether or not, because that's a really ambitious target, reducing it by 50%. And I'm wondering, is that kitchen waste ink and plate waste? Or is it just your own waste within, you know, the within what you're, how are you splitting it up and, and what steps are you taking? Because it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah, absolutely. It's an ambitious target, as I'm sure um, many companies are making. But um, yes, I believe I believe it's uh, kitchen waste. Um, it, I think it's hard. It's hard to control plate waste and measure that um, as a as a business. Um, I'll double check for you, Simon, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, kitchen waste. So as an example, um, I said we're working with Zero Waste Scotland um, on a project across the SEC and Hydro. Um, so they uh, we have um, kind of separate bins in the kitchens. Um, one of them we have less because we don't have enough space in one of the kitchens, but um, they look at um, prep. Uh, hang on, I'll have to remind myself of the exact bin breakdown. Um, it is storage, uh, prep, plate, and unserved. Um, so um, 
the teams, the KPs, the chefs will break it down into those bins um, and then the end of every single day um, will weigh the amount um, and over the next couple of weeks try and get a baseline um, figure and then look at where the majority of that waste is coming from um, and then do it do a lot of interventions. But um, as I said, the, the, the teams are really doing a, I've only given a snippet but doing a lot the chefs are doing a lot with um, food waste at the moment and making sure that um, when chefs are prepping so the prevention side of things that there really is no food waste there's not carrot tips going in the bin there's not broccoli stalks going in the bin there's there's uh, not um, certain parts of meat going in the bin like really being innovative to understand where we can use all of that um in a, in a clever way and some of the stuff they've done across all of our sectors is incredible so that as a tiny step um that prevention part is is huge um but it's we're, we're kind of at the stage where we're doing that measurement at the moment so it'll actually be really interesting to see where most of that waste comes from whether it is um the kind of production what the, what the chefs are doing um or if it is overproduction so with with a lot of our events it, it's working in partnership with the venue so it might be at the hydro where we're doing a big gig um, um we need to estimate how much food we need to prep for that event it might be based on numbers or it might be an exhibition um or a conference and we would base it on numbers from the previous years, but that's not always accurate. So you need to work really closely with the vet. It's, it's such a tough one to crack, um, but it's, it's, it's a journey and we can only learn as we go along the way. Thanks, Simon. Okay. <laughs> um, then we have a question in the chat Thanks, again. Thank you. I've got a question around uh, the, the carbon footprinting, but jump in there first yeah, but, go on, say, yeah. and then, um and then yeah i think we can pick up on kevin's kevin's chat there but um yeah for both of you actually we, we heard kirsten mentioned uh, a carbon footprint uh, sort of measuring projects that you're doing with with soci um south of scotland enterprise and and obviously emily you're talking about um the kind of carbon labeling uh, for each of the, the meals that especially you had at COP26, I'm not sure if that's like common practice across across all your your kind of gigs and and, uh, and sort of services and such like. But um, I'm just kind of obviously you know it's, it's not an exact science and and there's different different kind of measurements and different ways of monitoring these things. So I wonder if like, I could hear a little bit about um, what's behind that uh, if, if you know um, and who, who's behind it and how are they doing it uh and uh and yeah whether that kind of thing is is replicable or is would it be helpful is it helpful to customers to, to people if people want to hear that kind of thing um yeah so a bit about the, the, the sort of what's behind the measurements and and whether you think a, a kind of carbon mark or that labeling would be helpful okay, from a sort of customer facing that? perspective um yeah well, I'll, I'll probably give a baby version and then you can expand on the uh, <laughs> larger scale side of things um yeah, I was actually approached asking if we would be a pilot scheme for it. And their main reason for us doing it was to then be able to apply for grants and funding specifically for um, like climate um, money, because we've not ever applied for any funding or anything. And to be honest, I wouldn't even know where to start. But if you've got that evidence based of where you're sitting, um, then that helps you when you're applying for funding. Um, but it's like you say, it's so hard to find how you're doing that so they were using our coffee as an example in terms of they would look at our coffee supplier and they would get a score for them and then they would um work out how it gets to us and then how we are using it the amount of water we're using and then the fact that we've got all this leftover waste and i was seeing like all our coffee grinds get sent up to the local high school and they use it in their composting and gardening um scheme that they do up there so i was then asking how how does that take into consideration? And if we've got any waste in the refill shop, we send that up to the um, the Friendship Club and they use that as part of the um, the food scheme um, up there. So it's, yes, yes, we sometimes do have food waste, but we don't really because we, we manage it and it goes elsewhere. And it was a bit like what Emily was saying before with making sure there's no waste. So um, for example, banana peels, we put those in water and then we create fertilizer for the garden. Same with our like water that we boil the eggs in, we then use that um, in the garden to 
does that get taken into consideration or is it just a case you're boiling eggs that uses water yada 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 so but the, the idea is that it would create a carbon sticker for all of our um, products that we sell the refill for everything that we stock in the cafe and um, I think they are planning on doing it across supermarkets as well at the end of your shop you'll get something at the end of your till receipt that tells you how um, carbon neutral your shopping was that day so I think it's useful for people to know because I think people are too quick to just sweep it under the carpet and not really think about it whereas if it's there in black and white then they might be more inclined to make a conscious choice similar to people making conscious choices about the food labeling for um, like your your fats your sugars um, etc so that's my take on it thanks Kirsten um, Emily yeah no I I completely agree and and from our end we're definitely the start of our journey with with the carbon labeling and um Abby as you alluded to it's it's um it's not just about m measuring the, the carbon uh, impacts it's um about looking at the entire picture um mm -hmm. such as biodiversity metrics deforestation nutrition everything and um we've for for cop 26 um it was um clamato were the company that we part uh, that levy partnered with um for that um and uh part of the business like carolyn said in the video we're also working with uh, university of oxford on a, on a pilot as well um but i'm not as close to it um as some of the central sustainability team they're working on um it obviously we are a, a corporate beast um and it's not as simple as just partnering with the company and measuring the carbon it is so much bigger than that and our supply chain and everything else so um it's it's something that we're uh, trying to establish exactly what um who to, who to work with what to do with all of that um but i think from my my perspective and kind of what kirsty was saying um in england not in scotland just now but in england the calorie legislation has just come in uh, which means calories are going to be on all all menus across um uh, out of home catering and I, I feel like there is a risk of overloading consumers with information um, and with ca calories it's a bit more simple but I feel that people understand what, what calories are but then there is a, still a whole element of actually lower calories doesn't always mean better you could probably get a cheeseburger at McDonald's and it might only be 200 calories but it's full of God knows what. <laughs> um, so there's still a whole education piece on the calories part of understanding the quality of the calorie. Then you go and put carbon labeling on a, a, a on a menu on top of calories on top of probably something else in the next year or so. Um, and it's quite a lot for consumers to then put that figure on, but for them to also understand what that means. And I think with with carbon labeling, there's still a whole education piece that you need to pair with it. Yes, it's 0.2 uh, carbon dioxide emissions but as a normal consumer you'd walk up to that and be like I, I don't know does that is that good is that bad what's the average I don't know yeah. and so yeah. it it's a it's going to be a big journey to go on with this with carbon labeling and there'll be a lot of people jumping on it um Kirsty, like Kirsty said and we've done it in compass we're fortunate enough to have been able to measure our baseline carbon uh, emissions which is huge because then you work from that um but it's certainly uh it's certainly um, the start of the journey and um, it's new and we need to get it right. It can't just be based on the carbon impacts, but I think we're going to start to see it a lot, a lot, lot more from companies, one, doing it right, but two, probably from companies who just don't do it right and do it quickly for the wrong reasons. Thanks, Emily. Has anybody got any more questions that they want to ask? There was one from Kevin in the chat, and I think it it's kind of chimes a little with, you know, what, what you're saying about just the uh, sharing best practice, um, but maybe from a slightly different angle. Kevin, do you want to sort of speak to your own question, or should I read it out? Hi there, sorry. Um, it's just to find out if there was any educational resources that anyone could recommend, or sources um, of, of the material. From like a, a like a sustainability kind of educational point of view, or, or something different. Yes. Uh, yes. There. I mean, Google is sadly filled with probably all sorts of stuff. So it's knowing to go to the right places. But I mean, I can absolutely dig out um, dig out some stuff. Um, maybe some links to send across and the right kind of sources to read. Um, 
I can't think off the top of my head at the moment, Kevin, but I'm, I'm the same as you. It's a, I'm a nutritionist by trade and I'm learning the whole sustainability side of things. And it is an absolute minefield uh, to know how to get it right and to know what you're talking about, even when it comes to food waste. So, um, yeah, I can try and dig out some stuff from my end and send it over to Abby to maybe cascade. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. It's just if anyone's got anything else, we're doing, we're looking at doing um, like food education classes with young people. So it's sort of ages 12 to, well, it's open 12 to 25 year olds, but majority are school age. Um, so it's anything, anything simple, visual and easily understandable would be, would be great. Thank you. Kevin, yeah. as, um, obviously, I was um, a teacher for 10 years in a secondary school environment. Um, and I, because I was teaching PE, it was really quite easy for me to kind of have these um, chats with the pupils as I went along. But I um, I think it might be worth your time like, seeing if you can get like local, um, maybe farmers or suppliers or chefs to actually like speak to the pupils and get them to start thinking about what questions they might ask to see how sustainable things are and doing their own research, pick pick a brand that you might think looks ethical and get them to do their own research. You can talk about whether the sources or not are reliable, not just Wikipedia. Um, and that might, it might be rather than big like publications of sustainability because it's filled with all sorts of jargon. And I mean, obviously I'm um, similar to Emma, I'm kind of learning on the job as I go as well. And it's just through experience and research. I wouldn't say there's a go-to thing that I look at, there's um, a document called the Ethical Consumer that you can look at, which looks at specific um, brands. Um, yeah, I think really getting them to start teasing out and um, questioning techniques that they would perhaps ask of themselves, ask of um, suppliers, ask of brands might be quite a good thing for them to be involved in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I was also going to say, Kevin, we... Um, I said we I do a lot of teaching in schools from a nutrition and food and sustainability point of view and that we've got um, a sustainability module that's broken into three workshops um, which are food waste eating sustainably and then um, our planet and the our planet one is kind of on the non-food related stuff so about understanding what carbon emissions are and carbon labeling and plastic food waste is on everything from what does food waste actually do to the planet to how much are we wasting to how can we improve that um, and then eating sustainably is um, more on the kind of plant-based eating side um, where your food comes from uh, um, why we should look at local and seasonal sourcing so we've got those three different workshops um, and as Kirsty said you wouldn't pull together stuff like that for school children just from the like these intense publications um, I've got some kind of some key websites that I normally use. Um, the British Nutrition Foundation are um, uh, a, a company I used to work for, but they've got lots of stuff on their website. Um, from a food waste point of view, it's always good to look at RAP. Um, uh, so yeah, I can kind of send over some of those links that we would maybe use for, for an educational setting to get, to get the right stats as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Abby, Abby. Yeah, just just to add to that, Kevin, um, without without my sustainable food partnership hat on, with my propagate hat on, um, I do I do run a sort of series of workshops called Food Footprints. The last last time I ran it was in Cass Douglas a few weeks ago with the Better Lives Partnership, and similar. So what Emily was just saying it's, it's it's three sessions, um, looking at you know where our food uh, currently comes from and how it's produced, um, what we can produce in Scotland, and um you know and, and where that's currently and how it's produced uh and um that we did a visit a visit to a farm we went to um to the ethical dairies the rainson farm and uh, and then we cooked with some with locally sourced produce um so sort of barn barrack organic beef from from the machias and uh some of my own veg because I run a market garden um so yeah it, yeah just sort of very easy light touch kind of thing but that can be kind of expanded on as well um so happy to kind of share that with you uh, and I, I think something that, I, that I'm wondering about um, is that, that this kind of education is, is not just for young people, it's maybe for, for chefs and people that are running cafes and restaurants as well. It's not, and, and yeah, it's for, it's for everybody really, isn't it? So uh, I, I, Emily and, and Kirsty, I suppose, are you doing any work around or can you see the potential for uh, for kind of 
you know, sharing some of this best practice with, with other chefs. I guess this, this is part of that with this, this webinar, but, you know, is there a need for that and, and what are the opportunities around it? I think, I think definitely from, from our end, obviously we're a huge company and we're guilty of being bad at even sharing best practice between our sectors within our own business um, because it's so huge. Um, and I think it, I think we just need to be better at gripping onto the fact that when it comes to the environment and when it comes to net zero, it's not a competitive thing. It, it is something that we as a, as a nation, as a, a globe, that we need to all do. And so if someone's doing something really, really well, it needs to be shared. It can't kind of be kept all secret to one company. I, I do get that side of things and you're always going to have the business side, but I think this is a whole different kettle of fish when it comes to the environment. And, and yeah, I think there's definitely room for being able to share best practice uh, better between chefs and companies, 100%. Yeah, I completely agree with Emily. I'm not precious about anything that I do to try and kind of help the environment. I'm more than happy to help anyone who's already in business or wanting to start up with business about the best ways to do it. I think there's a completely different um, way of doing Like if you've got someone that comes in and like completely carbon copies everything you're doing, that's a completely different kettle of fish to someone generally just having a conversation with you about how they can um, use some of your ideas for sustainability. Because if they're also interested in sustainability, chances are they'll have some ideas for you as well. So it's about that um, sharing good practice rather than Holding, oh, there's no point in you doing sustainability really well because really what difference am I going to make in a tiny wee shop in Thornhill doing sustainability really well when lots of other places could be doing something similar. Yeah, I'm just thinking, Kirsty, about, you know, you talked about your supply chain. I mean, I just noticed Molly in the chat, Molly's talking about you're going to be opening a coffee shop soon. So I'm just thinking about the challenges, you know, like in terms of getting the suppliers that you want that got the same that values of what you have. I, mean, I imagine that's a bit of a minefield having to try and find out all that information. And then, but I suppose if people like Molly are looking at, I mean, like I said, it's not a competition, it's about collaboration. So actually you could probably help to maybe drive prices down a little bit, you know what I mean, with your supply chain, if you have got other people that can want the same supplier do you know what i mean in terms of like deliveries and quantities and that sort but yeah so was that a challenge curse to finding people with the same kind of values or what you were looking for you know for your vision yeah absolutely and again just because somebody uses the same supplier as you doesn't mean they're going to do it the same if we use rowan's milk just because well we know lots of other places that use rowan's milk but they get it delivered in plastic cartons rather than the glass bottle yeah. um and just because you get milk from rowan's doesn't mean you're going to use it in the exact same way as us um but no i i think there's a massive amount of suppliers and producers in Dumfries and galloway and in scotland but because of the niche that we're working with within that gets whittled down and whittled down and whittled down so it's only natural that people are going to be using like similar or the same people and like you say the more people that use these the um, more their costs can go down because i think yeah. that's half the issue is that all these ma people go and buy oats from the supermarket and they're going oh they're only 11p for 100 grams and i'm going but yeah look at this like the stock that they've got we're getting them from small um, small farms in scotland so yeah, the prices are going to be much higher. So, no, I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, in, this is in terms of sort of like for like the sort of the, the business model and the vision for me, because Emily, you come, you're working for a big company, Compass, and obviously Kirsty, you know, you are the the, the 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 thought behind the business. You know what I mean? In terms of you've got your well, you know, you've got your you've got you had your vision and you're fulfilling your vision through your business model. But Emily, what who's the drivers behind Compass? Who, who's the pe you know what what's the structure of Compass? Is it a is it a that's a I'm, that's I'm, a I'm good question. <laughs> um, I mean, you, I mean you can probably find the structure online, but it I mean it's absolutely huge. If you Compass Group is is global, um, so you've got kind of the CEO at the top of Group, um. But then I'm obviously part of the UK and Ireland business. So we've got a managing director that's filtered into kind of your, your senior leadership team. Um, but from a net zero perspective, obviously, we've recently taken on Caroline Ball, who is our net zero director, who you saw in that video. So I guess from a net zero point of view, um, 
she's a huge driving force in it but I, I there's not one person who drives it all it, it really is kind of it's it's collaborative across um different sectors um the business is far too huge to have one person driving it um so yeah it and I think it, it definitely helps when because we are such a big business there's a lot of people getting exposed to lots of different things that we can do so when things are shared up, up the ladder to the top um whether it's a supplier um that's come from Scotland that's actually doing incredible things or like I was talking to you about the seaweed um and how actually a large scale production of seaweed could actually do so much for the environment. If that gets pulled into the business from just one of the chefs who work in Scotland, that it could be that actually we use it across the entire entirety of the business. So yeah, it's it, it's a combination of um, so so many people. Uh, Marie, I can't really answer that as as one yeah. person. <laughs> but, but, the, but the ethos of the company, obviously you know the you know it goes beyond the carbon it's about sustainability like it says so there must be the ethos of the company is obviously even though it's so huge it's still obviously having the same sort of values as like Kirsty yeah, well, well, you know, yeah I think when you're in the food industry and how the, a, a lot of what we can do for the planet is is down to food and what we eat then as a, a one of the world's largest food catering companies you can't not have the same focus as that and that there's a a lot a lot a lot of people in our business from managing directors to chefs who are incredibly passionate about this and um really want to do something so it's actually something that's really um pushing um our business forward kind of quicker because everyone is is behind it um which is great and a a huge uh, thing to be successful i think in it yeah thanks um, thanks emily have we got any any more questions? Really interesting. It's really interesting. This it's very interesting. Yeah, we could go on, but if we could if we could hear know. from from uh, just just briefly from other people and what they're up to, because I think there's been some good good stuff in the chats mentioned. But um, anybody would like to, to sort of share with everybody, very welcome. Otherwise, we should probably start wrapping up. Any more questions from anybody? Just looking in the chat just to see if there's anything else in the chat. No, I think we've got, I think people have made connections. That's really positive. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to hear more from, from what other folk are actually up to, but we can maybe carry on the conversation uh, afterwards as well because what one one of the things that wants to sort of look at from this is you know what what to do what's next kind of thing um and do we need some sort of uh forum for for chefs and and sort of you know cafe restaurant owners to be able to share this practice across the region but yeah i mean what about with people i mean i'm just looking at uh like people like molly and denise i mean would would something? I mean, are you think about the similar model for the for the like the regenerative farm group? You think of something similar, are they? We're, we're basically like some sort of like support network of people can get together and talk about what they're trying to do and about supply chains and about what like people just setting up, just starting off. I mean, the people that are doing. I mean, that would, would that be really helpful? I'm thinking about Denise, Molly, with something like that where you could actually learn from people like Kirsty. You know, kind of get together and mm-hmm. share ideas would that be helpful um sorry i just saw that elizabeth had her hand up yeah i noticed that as well elizabeth yeah oh you need to unmute elizabeth you're muted there i'm i'm elizabeth chan and i'm owner of unique based in the trees and I'm one of the members of the Farmers Market um, across the Bridge of Galloway. We also trade in West Linton and some markets in the north of Cumbria. And we are artisanal bakers, my partner and I. We don't use uh, any artificial seasoning in our food. And we try to source as much as possible. Locally, I use the cider that is produced in um, around Thornhill too, and some honey 
around the region and um, meat that is produced in Sonora. So I, I tend to include some of the ingredients produced around this uh, region, as well as some vegetables of small orchards around and friends that I have that are um, passionate about planting their own uh, vegetables. So I use them quite a lot. So I'm looking forward to what's coming up. Um, I did make a few years, not a few years, two years ago, some uh, quince jam from the um, Hodham Estates. Uh, I have a friend that is a landscaper there. So there's a lot of things that are going around, but in a very small scale. And I think farmers markets are brilliant in the sense that uh, it teaches us so much about uh, food supply. And, and also I always tell people it's about um, feeding your body and soul, not just about getting cheap produce, but getting good produce that is produced around the region and um, not, not just the aspects that you all referred about, you know, carbon emission and sustainability. My business is the same. I mean, I tell people it's not about making a, a huge profit with my business, but mostly it's to feed people with love. And, and I think that's one of the things people also forget is food is energy. And, if you eat less and better, I think you become much happier rather than just eating to fill your stomach. So that's what, what we are about. So, and I, I believe in farmers markets. Um, myself, I grew up not in a farm, but my aunt had a farm in Africa and I thoroughly enjoyed all my holidays around the farm. And, um, there's much more to explain of, of the whole idea that I have around this, but I, I tried to, I, sub, I wrote something for COP26, but I was very late to submit it. By the way, my background is international relations, but I've been passionate about food. So I became a pastry chef in my thirties. So um, that's all. Thank you. And thank you for your, all your contributions. Thank you. Has so anybody else got anything to share? There seems to be a bit of enthusiasm in the chat for a set, setting up a WhatsApp group, um, just a, a yeah. sort of first step in, in sharing some of the practice around this and maybe get to organising some some sort of you know, visits to each other, um, like Denise is going to yeah. drop in on Kirsty next week. So. Yeah, so if you want to share that, I'll, I'll email out afterwards, obviously, after this event, um, just to say this, that the board will do this and folks should send me their phone numbers to, to add them to the to WhatsApp group if you're, if you're keen on that idea. Yeah, that is brilliant. Thanks, Harvey. Um, right, well, if that's, if there's any, if, could I just, so can I just thank Kirsty, fantastic. Emily, thank you so much. Really, really interesting. Loved, loved it. Uh, and I'm, uh, yeah, I think I'll be seeing Kirsty this week sometime. I'm sure I'm at yours on Wednesday with Esther, I think. I think so, yeah. Uh, but thank you so much. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everybody, for joining thank us. You. And thank we'll be we'll be in touch, won't we, Abby, with the uh, follow-ups? And... Yeah, I'm hoping that the next one's going to be... Well, the next one will be in May, and it will be around sustainable fish. That's, that's the plan. I haven't got an exact date for it yet, but again, it'll be a Monday morning, and it's looking at sustainable fish sourcing specifically. Brilliant. Uh, it's obviously a major topic, um, and there are a few links there in the chat. So, so the if you look out, look out on the state the Sustainable Food Partnership website for for updates. Um, but uh, also, yeah, there's something global called the Chefs Manifesto, um, which is for chefs all over the world who are kind of interested in this kind of thing to, to link up with and, and get involved in. So, they're having a an in real life conference in London um, a bit later in the year. Uh, so it's worth having a look at that as well. I think Laura shared that in the chat earlier. Yeah. Right, brilliant. Well, thanks everybody. Have a lovely day. And now we'll hopefully see you again soon. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thanks. Thank you.